As we know, in 2020, the world experienced a crisis with the likes of which had never experienced since the Spanish flu of 1918. Unlike the Great Recession, the crisis did not emerge because of structural economic problems. It was motivated by a worldwide pandemic that spurred containment measures that seriously conditioned economic activity. But let's start at the beginning. 2020 was not set out to be a great year. Forecasts from economists in December 2019 pointed anemic growth, especially in the Eurozone. The world as a whole would grow at about 2.5%, around 2% in the US, 6% for China, and about 1% in the Eurozone. We fast forward to March 2020, and by the end of the month, the COVID-19 epidemic was now a full-blown pandemic, with Italy and Spain health systems in severe stress. Forecasts were revised downwards, and the forecast for the world was now of no growth, slightly negative for the US, where the pandemic had not yet reached with full force, marginal positive growth for China, and a very negative outlook for the Eurozone, of close to minus 3% of GDP growth. However, everyone recognized that this was not your everyday crisis, or even the type of financial crisis that occurs less often, but for which there was a lot of work already done in understanding the respective dynamics. As such, these were forecasts with a very high degree of uncertainty. Forecasters also pointed to a downside scenario, where they believe that the world as a whole could contract to a bit over 1%, the US close to 3%, China to around 1%, and the Eurozone a bit over 3%. We reached June, and now forecasts changed dramatically. Draconian constraints to economic and social activity are in place in most developed economies, giving rise to supply chain disruptions, business closures, and mass layoffs. Forecasters are now very pessimistic about growth prospects in 2020, with expectations about world growth contractions being close to 5%, 8% for the US, and 10.2% for the Eurozone. The prospects for China were already better, though, as a consequence of the fact that policies in place to fight the pandemic had been started earlier and were now producing some results. The summer pauses and the epidemiological scenario lightens a bit, also as a consequence of the seasonal characteristics of respiratory viruses. News of vaccines being available in the future improve the outlook, at the same time that rescue packages are now being consolidated and implemented full throttle across the world. Forecasts start to improve and be revised upwards for all regions. The year ends and actual growth numbers become much more favorable than June forecasts. However, the order of magnitude of these contractions are much larger than anything recorded in modern history. We understand that these were times of large uncertainty, but how can forecasters miss their predictions by so much? And how could forecasts be made for the years after? It is good to remind the words of Harry Truman, former president of the US, that once complained and asked for a one-hand economist, because every time he needed advice, economists always said that on one hand this, but on the other hand that. And that is precisely what economists did. Economists recognized there was a fundamental dimension of the crisis that was outside their area of expertise and which would seriously condition any economic developments that could arise, precisely the epidemiological dimension. Any economic forecast would depend crucially on COVID-19 dynamics. Scenarios were drawn, conditional on the degree to which health policies would be effective in containing the pandemic, from being able to prevent community dissemination, to being unable to create the conditions that would allow the end of restrictions to economic activity. But of course, even along the economic dimension, there's a lot of uncertainty. Even under normal circumstances, it is not an easy task to predict the effectiveness of economic policies. As such, more scenarios were drawn, conditionally on the ability that policymakers would have in preventing job and firm destruction. These possible scenarios gave rise to conjectures regarding the speed and resilience of the economic recovery, depending on both economic and epidemiological factors. Would vaccines be effective? Would we have more waves of infection? Would economic policies help viable firms weather the crisis? As you can see, there are many unknowns that make it very hard to have firm ideas regarding what would happen in the future, especially in such exceptional times. 
At the same time, there was a polarizing discussion regarding the usefulness of non-pharmaceutical interventions as restrictions to social and economic activity became known. Correa and co-authors' preliminary work on the Spanish flu of 1918 actually show that cities in the U.S. that pursued more aggressive restrictions at the time enjoyed less mortality and stronger subsequent economic growth, as compared with other U.S. cities where the response to the pandemic was less restrictive. Is this proof that confinement strategies are indeed the way to go? Remember the limitations we alluded to when looking at these kind of studies. At best, what the authors did was to prove that, indeed, confinement measures were effective in 1918, in the US, in the context of the Spanish flu. The issue, as almost always, is external validity. The world economy in 2020 was very different from 1918. At the same time, the pandemic itself had also different features. The COVID-19 pandemic seemed to have a much milder impact on young adults in working age, for example. So what can we make of this? Well, it is good to remember that if considered only in the very short run, there is no doubt that more restrictions mean less economy, even if better health outcomes. But economies are dynamic, and what this study suggests is the real possibility that such restrictions might lead to better economic outcomes in the future. What were the prospects for 2021 then? The IMF produced forecasts that foresee strong rebounds for all regions and the world economy as a whole. There was the perception that there were not major structural issues in different economic blocks as the pandemic hit, and that once the epidemic dimension would be under control and restrictions to economic activity would cease, economies would rebound and compensate the drastic drops they have experienced in 2020. Differences in the robustness of recovery in the case of the US versus Eurozone, reflect different policy responses. The US government provided fiscal support to their economy to a much greater extent than any economy of the Eurozone did. And therefore, expectations were that growth in the US would be much more robust in the short run. Despite the expectations for strong rebounds in 21, there was a large degree of heterogeneity in terms of policies that each country adopted to fight off the crisis as it unfolded. Anderson and co-authors compiled data regarding fiscal policies in 2020. They divided them into direct fiscal support, which constitutes direct transfers or tax relief, which have implications for government budgets, credit and tax deferrals that only affect payment timings and thus do not constitute a fiscal burden, and other liquidity measures, mostly government guarantees to private loans, which have also limited budget consequences. First, we can see that the US had the strongest fiscal response to the crisis, and this difference only grew larger as time went by. Second, it is important to remember that direct state aid to companies is heavily restricted by EU treaties. But most of these restrictions were suspended during the state of emergency that was declared in most countries. Some of them took the opportunity to provide robust fiscal aid to the private sector while others put a lot more weight into providing liquidity, giving little support in terms of direct transfers and tax relief. This difference is important because liquidity measures do help in providing temporary relief but do not address the solvency problems that many companies face due to months of accumulated fixed costs from capital payments to infrastructure upkeep. Also, this has consequences for firm competitiveness, especially if we take into account that firms from different countries in the Eurozone do compete in the same markets. It is hard to argue which was the best approach, as the answer is quantitative in nature. There are trade-offs involved in providing fiscal support. On one hand, it allows viable businesses to remain open and competitive. On the other hand, it constitutes a fiscal burden for households and firms in the future and prevents the natural process of structural transformation in the economy in response to changes in the economic environment. The answer would only be provided later, on as numbers related to job and firm distractions emerge and provide a clearer picture of the extent to which fiscal policy prevented a deeper recession and promoted a faster recovery. Another piece of research that raised some flags regarding the health of the financial sector in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic was brought up by Kessinger and co-authors. 
they focused on the impact that credit deferrals could have in the stock of non-performing loans. This is a very important aspect to take into account, as the worst thing that could happen would be a financial crisis stemming from households, firms, and even governments not being able to make good on their debts. The authors had two approaches. First, to have a ballpark idea of the resilience of the financial sectors in each country, they looked at the range of impact on bank equity if 0 to 50% of all credit deferrals would become non-performing. The analysis shows that for some countries, this can lead to serious problems as the amount of non-performing credit would exceed 100% of equity, sometimes even 200%. For the second approach, the authors used historical relationships between the share of loans that become non-performing during crisis to infer the potential impact that the current crisis would have. Again. The results raised serious concerns for some economies, and this was definitely a dimension that motivated close monitoring by the main regulatory and policy agencies. Lastly, it is good to remember that regardless of existing significant differences in terms of fiscal support that the different governments provided to their respective economies, most of them constituted very large interventions, even for historical standards. The US were probably the country where the fiscal support was the strongest, and the concerns regarding pressures on prices started to arise. A surge in inflation could potentially threaten the recovery, as the Federal Reserve might be pushed to increase interest rates, thus raising the cost of capital in a context where debt spiked due to the crisis. As we can see in the figure, the difference between the nominal rate of return of government bonds and government bonds indexed to inflation, which captures what markets expect inflation to be over the next years, started to increase, and by the middle of 2021 had exceeded the 2% value that serves as reference for price stability for central banks by half a percentage point, suggesting that the Federal Reserve Board might have to intervene. Inflation numbers have since shown that much of the price spikes were concentrated in food and energy, items that are excluded from Federal Reserve Board considerations when looking at price stability, and also due to supply chain disruptions that were believed to be temporary. Expectations stabilized afterwards, hovering around 2.5%, which at the time ended up not raising much concern. In Europe, inflation expectations suggested much lower numbers, perhaps as a consequence also of much lower fiscal interventions, and consequently it was not a primary concern in the region. Nevertheless, it is good to remember that developed economies have experienced already a large period of interest rates close to zero. Debt is reaching record levels all across. In a world where interest rates might have to be borrowed up to fight inflation, this may imply that much of the debt, be it in the hands of governments, firms, or households, might become unsustainable, and this is a dimension of the economy that most surely must be under close watch.